The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Jana Bitten. I'm the Executive Director of the Oregon Center for Nursing. And um, I think that there are, are several people on the call that aren't necessarily tied directly into nursing or nursing education. And for those people, welcome. You're probably wondering why a nursing, a nursing program has put together a webinar that's based on all healthcare professions. And it's mostly because uh, the, the questions that have been coming up with nursing educators seem to be similar questions for just about every other healthcare profession out there. I think that as we are trying to get ready for uh, classes to resume in the fall. There are a lot of questions about how do we do this safely for students? How do we do this? Um, how do we do our clinical uh, placements in a safe way? And what has been discussed about what requirements we should keep in mind and what best, practice we, best practices we should understand as we talk about reopening? So for that, uh, I'm so grateful that uh, Dr. Veronica Dujon from the Higher Education Coordinating Council has joined us along with uh, Dr. George Mexicano from OHSU and also our friend Dr. Carla Hagen. Actual titles on here so that we knew, know who everybody is. Um, Dr. Hagen has so many titles that I only put one. So she can tell me if this was the correct title and this is, you let me know, she has quite a few. So, um, this is meant to be just a short presentation. What I've asked Dr. Dujon to, um, to share with us is a little bit about the process of how we are coming up with guidelines for reopening higher education in general. And then also, I believe you were talking about the different kind of work groups that have come together and what they've been, what they've been discussing individually. And then we can also talk a little bit about some of the recommendations that were made, what we know, what we don't know, and then we'd like to open it up for questions. So why don't we go ahead, um, Dr. Dujan, and you can share a little bit about the process and HEC's involvement um, in putting together or making some recommendations to the Oregon Health Authority. Thank you so much for that, Jaina, and I am more than happy to be here. I think as a coordinating commission, the key role of the HEC is try to make sure that the different sectors and the different interest groups, our communities, our students are on the same page and we remain coherent in terms of what the governor and the state, the Oregon Health, um, Oregon Health um, is, is trying to achieve. So in terms of background, I will try to be as brief as I can. The governor and her office anticipated that when the executive order for June 13th ended that it would have to be replaced with something and in terms of figuring out what would be new there was a very clear understanding that the post-secondary higher education sector was unlike maybe restaurants or businesses as complex organizations that could not pivot uh, on the drop of a dime and need some lead time to prepare would need specific guidance or should at least the governor's office should be sensitive to what those needs are so they turned to the HEC and asked um, if we could help convene different work groups to provide some recommendations so the governor's office could be sensitive and OHA could be sensitive to what these unique needs would be. In, uh, in the interest of that convening, there were a number of work groups, four of them. One would, um, focused on the public sector, one focused on the private in institutions, and um, the public sector was divided into the community colleges and the public universities. And there was a fourth work group. Given the unique place that healthcare education occupied and the urgency to make sure students could complete, I think particularly in a, a pandemic, there is an acute awareness of the need for these individuals to be you know, in the pipeline and getting out as quickly as possible. There was an entire work group dedicated to trying to figure out what these recommendations could be to feed OHA and the governor's office in anticipation of a new executive order replacing the June 13th order. Um, so that's exactly what happened. We, we sent out invitations, we got a group together. Um, Dr. Mexicano was part of that group. And I know there are other individuals on this um, webinar who were also part of that group. The objective was really to develop 
um, some minimums and some frameworks that were fairly high level and general with the understanding that each institution and in each locale or geographic region, depending on what kind of program you have, there would be some specificity, but you could, you could derive what you could do at your own institution and in your programs under the, the umbrella of that larger framework. Um, so uh, that larger framework has been submitted to OHA. There was initially a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three, sort of a phasing, a staging of that reopening. OHA has a phase one and phase two. My understanding is that it was very well received by OHA. Ben uh, Cannon, Executive Director Cannon from the HEC, met with Dr. Seidlinger at OHA earlier this week. We understand his staff are reviewing these recommendations, and, and that's as much as we have so far. Um, what else might I add? We anticipate, um, at least what Ben shared from that meeting with OHA, that there will be, as I said, a new executive uh, order coming out, and it will refer to OHA and head guidance in combination with CDC recommendations for higher ed resumption that were just published last week. So that I understand is fairly new. Um, uh, and so I have that much. I should add, um, what we understand is that the governor's office and the chief of staff are not inclined so much to a phased approach for resumption of activities for the post-secondary sector, understanding that educational institutions, the post-secondary educational institutions are complex organizations unlike mm -hmm. others, they have a different set of priorities associated with them, and they have added challenges in terms of shifting gears made, main, uh, midstream. Mm -hmm. They need some lead time, and, and there's a great sensitivity to the amount of lead time institutions need to be able to pivot or to get ready for the summer, for the fall. So the thinking at this point is that rather than leaning heavily into a phased approach, the understanding is to have some minimum expectations that would operate at any point in time. And so far, these minimum uh, expectations are perhaps are likely to be perhaps more closely aligned with the phase two recommendations. Mm -hmm. And that institutions would be expected to develop plans of their own to do planning, refer to these guidelines, also work with their local organizations and their local public health organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's as much as I have at this point in time. And I do know that um, both Dr. Hagen and Dr. Mexicano would be far more articulate about <laughs> the work that has happened so far in terms of the different kinds of instruction and clinical instructions and off-site and on-site and small group and large group. So this is all I have for now. And um, I don't know if any questions have come in or if we should transition perhaps into a discussion of what these recommended yeah, guidelines think, and framework have been. I think let's take it, let's hold off on your questions. I'm sure there's a lot of people who here who have questions. We'll get to that in a minute. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. that context. It really helps understand who is thinking about what and how we can make sure all of the pieces of this extremely complex puzzle come together. Um, Dr. Mexicano, I'm wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit about the process in, in, in the healthcare section or the healthcare work group that you were working with. If you could talk a little bit about what were some of the main themes of the recommendations that you that your group wanted to see implemented as people were starting to think about reopening. Um, one of the uh, principles was that we were really trying to balance um, uh, different uh, and important needs uh, um, and try to find essentially a, a way forward um, with that balance in mind. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through some of the issues. The first is PPE preservation. We know that PPE is a critical resource um, and we, do, we don't want to be in a situation where we use PPE needlessly. Uh, but we also need to, to um, 
balance that with the safety uh, of personnel. That's patients, students, faculty, staff members, et cetera. The third uh, need uh, is um, essentially a strong desire uh, for continuing academic progression, especially because we're talking about a sector that's going to actually uh, help uh, with regards to the pandemic. And so we, would, we didn't want to delay graduation. Um, and then finally, um, uh, there was this, this understanding that we also needed to make sure that we didn't disrupt clinical operations. Um, and so you try to weave those four together um, and they aren't necessarily aligned um, uh, but with that, but with those considerations, uh, we had a, a very a series of robust discussions. Both both Dr. Hagen and myself um, uh, were uh, on work group D that um, uh, uh, Dr. Bijan chaired, or at least facilitated. Um, there were many other um, people involved. So this really was a statewide effort, um, and over a series of uh, rapidly convened uh, uh, webinars, or I should say, um, uh, digital discussions. Uh, and then um, creation of working documents that I think in the end went through, I think, eight drafts, if I remember correctly. Uh, we uh, got to a consensus uh, that basically um, escalated the amount of protection of the learner uh, as they got, they went from essentially classroom instruction to uh, direct patient care activities. Um, and there's everything in between. So, for example, there's laboratory, uh, clinical skills, uh, simulation. Those are all, all uh, described in the recommendations that went to um, uh, through the HEC to OHA. Um, within that, I'll just be, be very brief here, but during the Q&A, we can go in more detail. And, and, and Dr. Hagan, please jump in here uh, at any time. Um, I'm going to just walk through with several principles. So one principle is um, the, the, the need for training and education, essentially preparation to, to re-enter clinical environments or to enter for the first time a clinical environment. So uh, we believe that mandatory education around infection control and utilization of, of, of PPE or personal protective equipment is critical. Um, uh, a second principle uh, is that uh, the uh, the learners um, needed to essentially, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, uh, which is that each clinical facility um, um, has guidelines and um, regulations that they have to abide by, um, and that we're, from, in many cases, we're guests in their homes, uh, and that we need to make sure that we follow uh, the guidelines that they have put forth. Um, you know, in an ideal state across all healthcare, there would be single standard across everything, and we certainly have, um, aspire to that. But we understand that there are some practical pieces. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, you know, when, when someone's N95 fitted, it's, it's for a particular type of mask, a manufacturer, if you will. Um, and if, if, you, if you're in one clinical system that uses one manufacturer versus another one, you're going to have to get trained and fitted in both um, uh, facilities, product of choice, if you will. That's an example of, of meeting the standard of PPE utilization and training, but still understanding that there are some nuances with each, each, within each clinical facility. Similarly, we thought that we needed to um, ensure that um, uh, if there was an exposure, uh, that infection control guidelines and protocols were followed and that students would have to report back to the student health center of their uh, um, academic program. Uh, and that uh, if such an exposure occurred, they should be immediately removed from the clinical setting not just for their protection, but of course, the, the, the patients that they're, they're, they're following. Um, and so those are some of the, the, the pieces that, that um, were put into play um, in the recommendations. And um, because of the nature of the pandemic itself, uh, we understand that the, the PPE guidance is changing um, and has changed. And so with it, we realize there's also, there's a dynamic component to this. And so rather than say, oh, it's this particular thing you have to use today. Um, the idea there is that, um, that, that you should, we should follow public health guidance at the, at the local as well as national levels, um, and that um, uh, this will be a, a continuously evolving uh, process. So let me stop there. I think those are, I think those are the major points. Um, Dr. Hagen, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. 
Well, I think the only other thing that I would add is really we went a little bit further in um, considering, you know, as George mentioned, in regards to the type of PPE within different environments. And then, you know, what it would look like in a clinical setting, we gave some definition to that as well. And then other considerations into, you know, what defines vulnerable populations, uh, how that may impact our students, again, going back to our student safety as well. And then travel and um, some uh, considerations around that and that many of us um, you know, I here in the Northeast definitely have students that are traveling from uh, one region to another and consideration on that as well. And then our entry into um, healthcare facilities, also uh, campus or institutional restrictions. I know I just had a meeting this morning with uh, Eastern Oregon University and looking at how we meld, um, you know, health professional programs into a um, basically a different type of of uh, more of a residential um, institution of higher education and so how does that work and then prioritization of our clinical spots uh, clinical restrictions and, and consideration again back to PPE and recognizing again what our um, you know, as George explained, when in Rome, do as the Romans, and that sort of thing. So really some forward thinking in regards to how we're going to communicate with our healthcare partners as well. And then um, also just to reiterate the dynamic nature of the pandemic, not knowing um, what may happen, recognizing that we may go into one phase and revert to another, and how do we prepare uh, how do we think ahead and begin preparation in that way so as to uh, the least disruption possible for our students of whom we are very committed to uh, not only progression but competency as well. Uh, if it, that's, that was terrific, Carla. Let me, let me add a, a couple of other lines I think are, are um, topics that, are, that were also important. We, we've been focusing the last few minutes on uh, primarily clinical instruction, but we did uh, there were a lot of other discussions when the, there was a fusing, if you will, of all the work group uh, discussions um, around what would happen in classroom situations, um, the need for physical distancing, and um, when one would go uh, from a face covering, um, for example, a small group discussion, uh, to actual sort of um, uh, medical grade um, uh, non procedure or sorry, medical grade procedural masks, for for example. Um, and then I want to go give, give one other example so people can understand the, the differences between facilities. One topic that's pretty um, getting heated right now is uh, for symptom monitoring as you access an acute care facility, um, some facilities are, are taking temperatures versus others are simply asking um, a questionnaire, have you had a fever? Um, so again, that's this concept of symptom monitoring is the principle, uh, but how one actually does that um, is going to be governed at the local level. Thank you. Thank you both. This is incredibly helpful. Um, and also just to remind everyone that we are still waiting for OHA to come back with the final recommendations. Like what the discussion that, that, that Carla and George have been talking about and some of these specific examples are the discussions that were had in the work group. And a lot of these are recommendations that were pushed to the Oregon Health Authority. And we are still waiting for the Oregon Health Authority to come back and say, and these are the recommendations that will fit with the governor's executive order so that you know that you're, you're following the guidelines that have been established. I think the reason why we wanted to have this conversation now, even though those guidelines have not, not been officially released, is because I think a lot of people on the call are working at places that where their administration is asking them to make some recommendations of what they're going to do on their individual level. So even if it's not perfect, this is just kind of like a fuzzy direction. Of, we, we're, I'm calling it the fuzzy target to try to hit. It's not going to be perfect and we may, may need to change. And I think that one thing that this pandemic has taught me and a lot of other people is how to live with a lot of ambiguity and how to be flexible. So with that, I'd like to open this up for questions because it sounds to me like a lot of the conversation has been very 
focused on how these recommendations and these guidelines and this thinking has been very, very broad so that institutions of learning and institutions of care can make up their own guidelines of what's going to fit in their own communities. So that being said, for the people on the call, this is your opportunity to ask some questions that maybe are on your mind about something that is actually very specific to you. And this will be an opportunity for um, Carla and George and Veronica to try to connect that with some of the conversations that have already happened. So for um, those who are on the call, if you would like to participate in the call, what you need to do is you can either go into the question box of your control panel and type in, I have a question. Uh, the moderator of today's call is our, our OCS operations manager, Kelly Illich, and she will unmute your line and she'll call on you and unmute your line so that you can ask the question. If you're having any kind of audio concerns or you'd prefer not, to ask the question through an audio method, it's perfectly fine. You can type your question into the question box and then Kelly can read it off. When you do, if you do have your line unmuted, please make sure that you introduce yourself and your organization so we have a good idea about who we're talking to. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. Kelly, if there's anybody who has raised their hand or asked a question. Not quite yet, so give okay. everybody just a moment to get their thoughts formulated. Looks like we do have a question from Ann Barr Gillespie with Pacific University. Ann, let me get your line unmuted here. And you are self-muted, so if you unmute as well, you should be able to go ahead and ask your question. There we go. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Ann. Um, thank you so much, uh, panelists, for uh, for doing this today, and and Jana for organizing it. My question is around um, any advice that you might know of around testing. Um, you know, I'm on. Uh, I of course have health professions at my university, but we also have a residential campus. We're having lots of conversations about how do we test students who are returning to campus who are residents of the campus who are commuter students, uh, how frequently should testing be done if we do undertake it, and, and really what's the value of the, the, uh, the PCR test versus the antibody test, and, and sort of what's the state of play on testing at this point. And I, the only other thing I'll add to that is we have lots of nervous parents who insist that testing must be done before their um, kids can return to campus. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of emotional pressure and are trying to answer these questions with sort of sound evidence-based responses. So I'll put myself on mute and listen to your answers. Thank you. I guess I'll start and other people can chime in. Um, hi, Anne, it's George. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, work group and the uh, recommendations that were submitted to, um, to the, the Oregon Health Authority were actually silent on the issue of testing. Um, uh, unless, Veronica, something changed the last minute. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I, and I want to make sure that people sort of understand um, some of the concepts here. The, 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 idea, the, the idea is that um, testing and contact tracing um, is really going to be a local public health department run kind of activity. Um, and so um, uh, the, the, the statewide plan as well as the local public health department plans would be in place with regards to that. I think universities and um, other um, higher education institutions can play a role in that, but, but we really do need to work hand in hand, in hand with, with public health. So that's sort of, the, I'd say, one of the concepts. With, with regards to specific testing, this is not the work group, this is not OHSU, this is not the heck, this is, this is uh, George Mexicano, who for some of you know, I'm, I, ha I happen to be an infectious disease specialist, but this is a personal opinion. Um, so just um, keep this with a very big grain of salt. The problem with testing um, is that it's, it, uh, it's essentially an in the moment result. Um, and as all of you know, they are false negatives um, and they're actually some false positives, although those are small. Uh, and so um, it's really hard to, to know how to use the result of a test uh, and we know that there are, um, uh, well, I'll say it this way, I personally know of, of, of cases in Oregon where uh, patients, for example, were, were uh, found to be negative at, on day one and they turned positive on day two. 
Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, 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 I think in some ways it, it provides a false sense of assurance that I would be very cautious uh, with regards to interpretation. The other issue is between P a PCR or what's called a NAT test, um, uh, nucleic acid amplification test, versus a um, an antibody test, which is a serologic test, is that you know serology um, is essentially proof of past infection, but there's so many uh, serovirus of, co of coronavirus that um, uh, some of the commercial tests, frankly, um, have not been performing to the levels that we that that we would want as a society. Mm -hmm. um, and so, just because one has a past history, um, uh, proof of a past exposure to a coronavirus doesn't mean it ha happens to be uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the coronavirus is the, that causes COVID-19. Um, so, I think they have to be um, interpreted very, very cautiously. So, I wouldn't personally not recommend using testing um, for the purposes of learners, especially. Uh, except for in diagnostic purposes when you're trying to find out someone who might need um, uh, to go into isolation and things like that. Great, thank you. All right, other questions, Kelly? Yes, we have a question from um, Sandra Kellogg with Chemeketa Community College. Her question is related to lab and simulation settings. And she is hearing that there that um, instructors and students must remain six feet apart, even with personal protective equipment on. And she says that doesn't help when they are teaching skills that require close contact with a student. If they are in PPE, can they work in a closer proximity with their students? Again, I'll start, um, and the the answer to the question is that the, the recommendations that were submitted actually included um, or differentiated between clinical skills um, and other laboratory experiences um, that were not in close proximity, that, that six foot distancing um, uh, uh, and physical distancing could be maintained versus laboratory experiences and, and especially clinical skills experiences um, where close proximity um, had to be um, part and parcel, especially if there was physical contact. And the difference was, and I'll just use gloves as the as one example, is that if there was physical contact because of like, say a physical exam maneuver, then gloves would have to be then be be part of it. Versus if there was no physical contact, then a um, a medical grade but non sterile medical grade procedural mask would be okay as opposed to a face covering. So you could sort of think of it as as the PPE grade and the number of things that one would wear increased the closer you got to people. Um, and then when it, when we started talking about, like for example, mucous membranes, we, we started talking about eye protection as well as face shields. So the answer to your question um, uh, more succinctly is, yes, there is a clear understanding uh, that um, close contact, including physical touching, um, uh, did need to occur to develop clinical skills, um, and therefore physical distancing would not be in play, but that PPE would have to be escalated uh, depending on the context. Thank you for that. I have a question on that too. So does that mean as far as, does the recommendations that you made in the discussion, did you outline exactly, you were saying that you outlined exactly the amount of PPE they would be wearing the closer they actually had to get to a person. Um, one of the things that we have discovered as part of the discussions we've been having on Fridays is that a lot of education programs donated their stock of PPE to the hospitals as soon as the pandemic came came out. And now they're in a situation where they're having um, trouble identifying PPE for their students. Um, was that discussed at all? Because I think that, and maybe Veronica, I don't know if that was, you can speak to this. I. I think that there is a little bit of a concern that um, some educators don't want to don't want to be competing for the medical level PPE that needs to be used to treat the sickest of the sick of the COVID patients, and they also need something so that they can be training their students. Was that something that was brought up? The ability of schools to be able to locate PPE. That did not come up in the work group session I participated in but it may have been at the institutional level or in meetings I wasn't part of. So I think maybe George or Carl 
can address if that was part of the discussion. Uh, uh, I, you're, you're right, Veronica, that the, um, uh, the work group discussions acknowledged the, the challenges, um, but did not address the issue. Um, I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge in particular as more, as more parts of the state uh, open up um, and more and more people are going to be using uh, uh, personal protective equipment and as the hospitals increase their elective procedures, um, there's going to be um, more and more, uh, I want to use the word competition. The good news is the supply chain is improving. Um, but the need also is improving, and so um, um, it's going to be um, challenging for for sure. And Carla, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, I was just going to, uh, you know, I could go ahead and I think George touched upon it, but I could share exactly what, um, you know, within a lab situation, what was proposed. So close proximity, less than six feet, but no physical contact. A uh, non-sterile procedure mask uh, for close proximity with physical contact, but no exposure to mucous membranes, non-sterile procedure mask, and non-sterile gloves. And then into the third category, close proximity with physical contact and exposure to music, mu mucous membranes, non-sterile procedure mask, non-sterile gloves, non-sterile gown, and non-sterile face shield or other eye protection device. Okay, great, thank you for that. Kelly, are there other questions or hands raised? Yes, I see Casey Shillam from the University of Portland has her hand raised. Casey, I'll get your line unmuted. Hi, thank you, Kelly. Can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm Casey Shillam, the Dean of the University of Portland School of Nursing, and I really wanna thank um, OCN for hosting this time and for everybody um, with this incredibly important information. Um, I wanted to just um, offer some insight about um, what I learned at my own institution just yesterday, just to share this as um, a follow-up on, George, what you were talking about in terms of the work of the pub local public health departments. Um, so we are a, a private, um, you know, liberal arts university residential campus, and we are working toward having um, reopening our campus in the fall for face-to-face -face instruction and, and residents moving back onto campus. And we were really struggling with the questions of contact tracing, of testing, of how are we going to manage the microcosm of our university um, you know, with with all of these questions and concerns and in um, um, reaching out to our public health officials at the health department, I was so relieved to learn that we not only don't need to do that level of work, that, but that we, we should not be doing that, that we really need to instead be developing a liaison or some kind of a designated person on our campus who will then be the main point of contact for helping to facilitate the work that needs to happen with the local health department. So I just wanted to offer that up because, you know, as as a, a community-based nurse in my own practice, that was my first thought on our campus was how are we going to manage the magnitude of that level of, of responsibility when we don't have the resources or the infrastructure? And, and it was really great to hear that we don't have to. So I just wanted to offer that up as a, a lesson learned that um, we're feeling really, really good about being able to do that level of having a liaison, developing our own policies and guidelines and procedures. But um, George, I just wondered if there were any other ideas or thoughts that you had about you know, that relationship that we're able to build with our public health departments that we should be taking into consideration. Uh, my only suggestion would be communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> that this is this all relies on on uh, I mean obviously protecting privacy of our of a of both of students and of course patients with FERPA and HIPAA. Um, but but uh, clear communication about when there is a potential exposure. Um, not being afraid to escalate things to public health. Um, they're there to help us. And they're not there to hurt to hurt us. Um, uh, it, it really is going to be a public. Um, uh, community uh, partnerships, plural, uh, that, that's going to help us all get through this. Thank you so much. 
I think that one of the themes that has been coming out, especially in the last couple of weeks, is that you know that relationship and that communication between individual educators and the, the indica- individual education institution and the public health department is going to be really, really important for all nursing and all healthcare, whether it's going to be university and post-secondary education or even K-12 education. I think that having that connection so that you can communicate with worried parents and you can communicate with your students is really important. Kelly, are there other questions or hands raised? No, I am not seeing any. Oh, I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. Yes, I see Pam Pfeiffer from George Fox University has raised her hand. I'll unmute her line. Hi, this is Pam Pfeiffer from George Fox University. Uh, Thank you, Jana, for putting this together. Um, thank you, panelists. This is wonderful. You, George, especially, I think you were mentioning the difference between face coverings and non-sterile procedural masks. Can you clarify that a little bit more, um, especially with the concern of even having those non-sterile procedural masks in less than six feet spaces? Can students provide, you know, can they use face coverings that that they provide or that somebody's made? Or is the recommendation that they have to be a um, more of a procedural type mask? It's a really good question. And I'm going to say my comment, but but realize that this is a, um, what I would say, a gray gray zone area. the, there, first of all, there is current OHA guidance on face coverings. I encourage you to go to the, to um, if you Google or whatever search engine you use, um, OHA coronavirus, you'll get right to the web, to the to the web page, and it has all this information, um, the, the county dashboards, the governor's uh, links to the governor's uh, COVID-19 web page, um, um, uh, all the guidance, et cetera. So, so I would encourage you to, to use that resource uh, frequently. Um, uh, in, and, and as one of the OHA guidances, there is, a, um, I think it's a two-page document um, that describes face coverings. And, the, and, and I'm going to say, say two important things, um, and then I'll answer the, or try to address the question. The first is that face coverings is not in place of physical distancing. Um, and it, I think it's really very important to understand uh, that concept. It is a, it's, it's an additional mitigation factor to help those that might be contagious to reduce the, the, the chance of a droplet coming from their oral, oral pharynx or nasopharynx um, and coming into contact with someone else, uh, or for that matter, uh, fomites in the environment. So um, uh, being separate from people is still important. And so if you're in a small group uh, discussion room classroom, for example, or even a, in a lecture hall, you, it, it's both face coverings and physical distancing that need to be in place. And that's stipulated in those in those OHA documents. Uh, the second piece though is that they, even though there is face covering um, uh, guidance, the problem is um, in, uh, and I'm gonna use a colorful example here in a second, the problem is in execution. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I teach on sexually transmitted infections uh, and I've seen many, many, many patients with, with STIs. And I will tell you, um, uh, telling someone how to use a condom and other barrier does not mean they, do, they use it well or they use it all the time. Um, and that's the problem, right? And so when you, when you have face covering guidance, um, it will help. It will help um, uh, reduce dro- droplets uh, that are uh, generated uh, by the fact that we talk and breathe and sing and cough, et cetera. That's very different than a, um, a, a mask that has been designed on purpose to capture those droplets. Um, uh, and if you think about the stuff that's being made, I mean, I think people are being very creative. It's, it's fantastic to watch people literally sewing masks and that kind of stuff. But, but whether you know, the, the material matters, for example, it also matters if it's wetter versus, versus dry. Um, and so I don't have it personally, I don't have any confidence that a, that a face covering will really be effective at protecting our students. Um, when we're getting within two meters or six feet. And that's the issue. So I, so to me, I thought it was very important, um, and I was an advocate for this, that we essentially switch from a face covering 
which is perfectly fine in a lecture hall or a small group room or even in a lab where you can maintain physical distancing. Uh, but once you get in close proximity, uh, I think you have to, we have to up our game. And, and it, to me, it's, it, it's sort of a practical answer to, your, to the question. Um, that, of course, is a challenge if PPE cannot be obtained, if these masks cannot be obtained. Uh, so, so to, but to me, there's a very big difference if you get within six feet and whether or not um, that the, the mask is um, going to be effective or not. Now, all of us know even the best uh, uh, high-grade medical equipment can fail uh, uh, because of human error and system errors, right? Um, and, and we need to acknowledge that as, as well. But I, I really think there's a big difference between homemade um, uh, facial coverings uh, versus um, something that's specifically designed to prevent droplets um, uh, from being um, generated, not, not generated, but being transmitted across space, which is really what the issue is here. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, other questions? Kelly, are there any other questions or are there any hands raised? I don't see any other hands raised, and I believe there was another question, but I think it just was answered by Dr. Mahikana. So. Okay, well, I have one question, and then I want to throw it back out to the audience in the last few minutes that we have. Was there any discussion while you were, while you were, um, while you were meeting and making your recommendations, I think it's one thing to be moving from phase one to phase two, but what do you do when you have to move from phase two to phase one and moving backwards? Is the way that it was the recommendations were designed, were they, especially as you were saying in the beginning with higher education, it isn't something that you can just stop. If you need to be moving, if, if we have this a second surge like people have been talking about, we need to move from a phase two or a phase three down to a phase one or back into lockdown or whatever phase zero is. Was there discussion about what that movement would look like and what those expectations would be? I can confirm that there was discussion. And I do recall in the framework that was presented, not, not the health uh, education framework, but the larger one that dealt with the post-secondary institutions. There was a graphic that attempted to capture how you would move from phase one to phase two. You would wait 14 days, which is the sort of the period of incubation or quarantine that you would need, take stock then, and, and if there were increasing um, numbers of cases, then you would there would be a way to go back to phase one. So mm -hmm. there was active discussion, and the individuals who had worked on the project I do know worked in collaboration with a, a national or Western state network of people who do emergency um, preparation and emergency response. So it was in architecture sophisticated beyond what we would just think of. Others mm -hmm. have put a lot of time into how do you um, do that pivoting back and forth. So I can confirm that there was that discussion, but I, in terms of the health care, health education, context, I will defer to George and Carla if there are any greater specificity in terms of what that would look like. So there, there's, there's two comments to make to, that I can think of. The first is that if you actually were to look at the, at the recommendations, I know we're not necessarily sharing them, but mm -hmm. uh, because it's not up to us, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it has it and they're going to make up their own minds, which is, which is perfectly fine. That's, that's why they're professional. Um, uh, public health experts that know that, that will provide mm -hmm. guidance for the entire state. But the, um, uh, if you look at the, if you actually saw the language, there actually is no difference in the clinical environment between phase one, phase two, and phase three. Okay. And the idea, the idea is it doesn't matter um, if uh, there's one case or if there's a thousand cases, if you have a, if you have a student who's taking care of a patient because they have respiratory symptoms, um, you would need to protect so it's, it's like the operating room, right? Um, you're going to have the same um, sterile technique, uh, um, whether there's an outbreak going on in, out in the community or, in, or for that matter in the hospital, than, uh, than for any case that would occur under routine circumstances. So there is no transitioning in the clinical environment uh, uh, when, you're, when you're literally in, um, sort of in, in, um, uh, in front of people. However, 
Uh, having said that, um, there is, I think, an, an, an important piece, which is to say, what about the clinical facilities when you're not in direct patient contact? And you can think of whether it's an ambulatory clinic uh, or a hospital ward or the operating rooms or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we even talked about homeless camps, for example. Um, then um, uh, there's this, this, this understanding that um, you have to go back to sort of the minimal amount of protection. And so all of a sudden workrooms and hallways and things like that become an issue, um, even when you're not directly seeing a patient. And that's an important thing to consider. So, so in, um, I guess what I'm trying to say, not so succinctly, is um, that the, the going back and forth uh, is less of an issue in an acute care facility. In the classroom setting, it's exactly what Veronica said, um, and there was a lot of discussion around that with, with other people who are not on this call, um, uh, but it was a very robust series of discussions, actually. And I don't know, Carl, if you want to add anything to that or not. No, I don't think so. I think more is the concern if, you know, we move out of, you know, if we move back into more of a uh, modified state where, you know, there is a resurgence and we mm -hmm. move out of phasing and, and, and what are our alternative plans at that point in time in respect to our student progression? I, you know, it, it's interesting. This is a, this is a personal comment, but, but I just want to, I want to guess I want to have everyone sort of pause for a second. A lot has been focused, I think, on this concern about well, what can we control? Um, uh, and I want to flip it around and say, just acknowledge what we cannot control. Um, yeah. And um, uh, it goes back to that adage of when in Rome do as the Romans do. The clinical facilities are going to make their decisions um, based upon the situation and their infection control guidelines and, and, and their, their capacity and ability to take care of patients. So we may have all these wishes about phase three, phase two, and phase one, but if a clinical facility frankly says, to, I need the students out of here, it's gonna happen. And we need to be prepared to be nimble, <laughs> regardless of what the main campuses are doing. The clinical settings are the clinical settings. And I want these people to really understand that there's a lot of stuff that frankly is not in our control. And we have a, I think the best we can do is be prepared to pivot um, and and uh, and prepare our students um, that they have to may have to they may have to be pulled um, depending on what happens with surges in the future or PPE supply or the or the faculty supervisors and and the pressures that they have um, and that and, and and so forth and so on. There's a lot of unknown here and it's not going to get clearer for a while. I think I should also add that our understanding at the heck from the governor's perspective is that perhaps for the post-secondary sector, higher education and healthcare education in particular, it's not conducive or well aligned with that phasing model. Mm -hmm. That in fact, you must maintain minimums all the time until we are solidly into a phase three and a current of, and a virus and a vaccine, I'm sorry, is available. So the thinking has shifted into whether or not a phasing approach is appropriate for the post-secondary sector. Yeah, that's right. Great, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. It looks like we have one more question, Kelly. Do you wanna go ahead and address that one? Um, yes, so we have a question from uh, Casey Shillam and she's wondering if you have been given any indication when the guidelines um, related to PPE use in lab and SIM type situations, when those might be released. Um, I want to clarify, there's going to be guidance with, for the higher education sector, um, and that's what we've been talking about, and Veronica can weigh in on what Director Cannon um, uh, has shared, <laughs> uh, um, if she's able, able to. Um, the, the PPE guidance um, is going to be um, basically dictated uh, by uh, what the guidance is for the clinic for healthcare writ large. Um, and from what I've heard personally is um, there was a draft that actually was, um, they were looking for, the medical advisory panel was looking for feedback um, that I think the door closed yesterday and there's an executive order about PPE specifically um, that will be released very soon. I don't know exactly, but it's within days from what I understand. Um, it has to do with the, 
the concept of not so much which what PPE, but this idea of tiers of PPE um, that um, different healthcare facilities were using. Uh, for example, can you reuse a face shield? It was stuff like that. But I don't and know, I Veronica. Don't, I don't have any more information than that, except I, I understand that the CDC did release guidelines specifically for the higher education sector just last week or yeah. a couple of days ago. So I'm certainly not familiar with that. And we do know that OHA, the reports were that the recommendations that were made from the work groups were well received, but mm -hmm. the staff are reviewing it this week and we're hoping for some guidance to come from OHA soon, but that's all we know. So just to clarify, to make sure that I understand. So what we're actually looking at is we're looking at some guidelines from the Oregon Health Authority that are related to higher education, but we are also looking at some guidance around PPE usage in this tiered approach. So there's almost like two sets of guidance, two sets of things that we're looking for as educators are starting to plan to resume nursing classes. Um, I would even go further, which is okay. a little scary to talk about out loud, um, because there's also the, the, the contextual piece of the county that you're residing in. And, uh -huh. what, um, and unless that's changed, the counties will be in different phases um, uh, at different times. They have been, right? And so, and that's everything from, you know, the, the, the communities that the campuses are situated in and what can, what, what can be, what will be allowed, et cetera. So um, this is not gonna be sort of everyone's in one place at the same time. Um, it's gonna be much more complicated. And, and, and I think if you look at the governor's executive orders and, and, and the reopening Oregon plan, you'll see that there are some sectors like, for example, um, um, uh, well, the, actually the summer, the, the summer camps, right? That's a statewide guidance, right? Yeah. Whereas other things like restaurants, that's a county guidance. Right. right. So, so, so you have to understand that there are many <laughs> guidances that anyone has to look at and what's, what's true at, in place A at time one is maybe different than a place B at time two. Yeah. And I would like to reiterate what George said earlier, that it then becomes extremely important to communicate regularly mm -hmm. and often. So there, there is alignment and people, institutions and counties and the state there, even though there is variety and, and different contexts and conditions, the alignment and consistency is there to deliver an outcome that's all directed at the same thing. Great. All right, it looks like we have one last comment. Kelly, do you, can you open that up? Yeah, let me unmute um, Ann Bar Gillespie's line, and then we've had another hand pop up as well. Ann, your line should be open now. Great, thank you. Uh, there may be a question in this comment, but it, it's in reference to what George was talking about, the things we don't have control over, and then Veronica, you know, the acknowledgement that moving back and forth in institutions of higher ed is really challenging. Um, probably for the first time in my career, I'm, I'm faced with the possibility that the things we don't have control over are going to potentially delay our students' progress no matter what we do. I mean, it's, um, you know, between what the clinics may have to decide and with, with all respect for um, the circumstances they're facing uh, and our... Um, ability to keep students safe and even our students in their own individual circumstances that make it difficult for them to feel comfortable being in close personal contact with others, whether they have a health condition or a COVID-19, you know, what have you. There are all kinds of threats to student academic progress. Um, and, uh, and, help, and, and, you know, we just need some um, some consideration for managing students' expectations, um, mm -hmm. I think, from uh, whatever uh, guidance we can can possibly obtain, because they're they're just right at this point, you know, really grieving the the um, impact of this on their plans, and mm -hmm. uh, and depending on what stage of processing that they're in. Um, we're having some conversations with people that are pretty strained and pretty uh, emotional. Um, and, you know, so I, I just, I, you know, I just want 
to comment on that. It, it really is where we're living right now um, with the students and, and uh, you know, it's just a challenge that we're facing. Um, so I don't know if there's a question there, but. Yeah, um, and, and, <laughs> and there doesn't, yeah, and yet it doesn't have to be because the, what you're describing is the of the grief that students are experiencing. I think we're that's being reflected in a lot of different areas, and it's really it's heartbreaking, and yet everyone's experiencing their own kind of grief. So it's it's thank you for sharing that because I just want to validate that there are that this is something we really need to keep in mind that you know as we're trying to change these expectations we really need to go back and communicate and communicate as clearly as we can in this completely ambiguous situation um that's that's kind of the goal is to just try to be as clear as we can all right well i think we're going to go ahead and wrap up thank you to everybody thank you to all of the panelists and thank you for those who came